This conference will now be recorded. Great. All right, so good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Summer Poetry Festival co-hosted by the New England Poetry Club and the Friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters and the National Park Service. Uh, my name is Emily Levine. I'm the Supervisory Park Ranger at the Longfellow House. Um, today we are thrilled to welcome award-winning poet Afa Michael Weaver and all of you to this afternoon's reading. Um, Henry Longfellow's poetry and his home, it really brought folks together over 150 years ago, and we are pleased to be able to continue honoring it and, and sharing in that legacy today. So we hope that you've all found a comfortable and cool spot of your own from which to join this virtual community and uh, enjoy this afternoon's reading. Looks like a couple of folks found spots outside, so that's really lovely. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. For this afternoon's event, please do keep yourself on mute in order to ensure an uninterrupted reading. You'll be able to find the mute button uh, located at the bottom of your screen. As I said, this event is being recorded. So um, what we are going to do during the reading is ask you to turn your camera off um, so that AFA will be center stage in the recording. Um, we may turn it off for you, <laughs> um, but just for a little bit while we do the reading, we'll ask you to have those off. Uh, you may, and we encourage you to turn it back on during the Q&A portion in the second half. Uh, finally, we do recommend that you view this event in view who's talking mode, which can be found up at the top of your screen right in the center. There is also a chat function available to you. So please send a message to organizers only using the chat box. If you have any questions or technical issues, myself um, and my colleagues will see that and respond. Uh, as I said, following this afternoon's reading, we'll be opening it up for a Q&A with Afa Michael Weaver. We will be inviting folks to put your questions at that point into the chat box. So start thinking about those. Um, I will then call on folks one by one in the order those questions come in. And we'll invite you to put your camera on and take yourself off mute. You can ask your questions sort of face to face. All right. Um, lastly, we invite you to join us on August 9th for our final virtual poetry festival event for summer 2020. We'll go ahead and put that link in the chat. It will be a reading with Maria Luisa Arroyo and Peter Covino featuring uh, both original works and works in translation. So we also hope that you'll join us for other upcoming live events in August and beyond, um, including an introduction to the Longfellow House uh, living history program featuring suffrage and abolition songs and our upcoming fall lecture series. Um, I would uh, also just like to extend a real sincere thanks to our wonderful, wonderful partners, um, the New England Poetry Club, the Friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters for their dedication to sustaining this series, to making it happen, um, and to the poetry community through these challenging times. So I would now love to invite Mary from the New England Poetry Club to introduce Alpha Michael Weaver. So hello and welcome. Uh, my name, as Emily said, is Mary Buchinger, and I'm president of the New England Poetry Club. And it gives me truly great pleasure to welcome and introduce Afa Michael Weaver on this virtual platform with the Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site. And thanks to Emily Levine and to the rest of the staff and also to the friends of the Longfellow House, whose support really makes this summer festival of poetry possible. So please do consider supporting the friends. So why am I especially pleased to introduce Afa? I'm happy to say he was my teacher once. And as teachers go, my teacher always. I will never forget the day, the first day of class with Afa. One summer at the Joyner Center at UMass Boston. He came into the room, learned everyone's name, and then read this beautiful, fresh, exploratory, poetic essay he had written that morning about spiders in their webs and writers in the world. Afa Michael Weaver, author of 14 books, recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious Kingsley Tufts Award, 
multiple Pushcart Prizes, a Pew Fellowship, the May Sarton Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. A student of Chinese culture and language for most of his life, he was awarded the Gold Friendship Medal from the Beijing Writers Association for his work with Chinese poets. And he was also the first elder of the Kave Kanem organization. In an interview, Afa Michael Weaver said, quote, there's a meeting place in the mind and a consciousness where God sort of lets us go on our own, our own minds and consciousness or what we call mind is connected to God. It's the root of our spirituality. In that rabbinical tradition of the Kabbalah, there's a saying that wisdom begins above thoughts, or when thought ceases, wisdom begins. He continues later in the interview, and I think that poetry, due to the fact that the creative state of consciousness is so much similar to the dream state, in that opening up of the mind that's a prerequisite to writing poetry, there's also an opening up to the areas where things are kept. And I think that a lot of what may appear to us in the form of poetry comes out of these canisters where things are locked. The name Afa means oracle in the Igbo language. And as Afa explains, quote, it's not a fortune teller as in telling the future. It's more like a therapist. A person who has that name should be able to clarify your present context for you if you don't understand what's going on in your life. So I think it is a vessel or better still, I might say it's a portal. Professor, playwright, poet, portal. Please join me in welcoming Afa Michael Weaver. Thank you, Mary. Um, and hello, everyone. It's a uh, it's exciting to imagine myself actually being there in Cambridge in the Longfellow House. And uh, thank you for that gracious introduction, Mary. And thanks to New England Poetry Club and the Longfellow House. Um, this is really, really good. Uh, I'm still getting used to this virtual world, but um, this is just quite wonderful. Um, I'll be reading from uh, Spirit Boxing only today. and. Um, it looks like that <laughs> and it's dedicated to my wife uh, Kristen the inscription reads true minds true love a little bit of the preface of the book spirit boxing resides inside the zenith of Tai Chi Chuan the ancient masters said one could achieve a unity of mind body and spirit through sublimation and the study of oneself in relation to other human beings, to all creation with faith and devotion. The intuitive mind suffuses a sublimated self and one is guided by deepening integrity and moral sense. In 19th century industrial engineering, designers imagined the factory as a perfect machine and workers themselves machines, as modular systems that serve the machines. In Ezekiel's vision, the spirit inhabits the machines. The liberation of the worker, his or her reclaiming of life and voice, depends on the awakening of the spirit. The spirit lives and reconstructs that system of wheels such that the wheels generate life. Such is the hope of this collection. 
I was a wheel inside the wheels. John Henry, sleeping in high grass. Mowers miles away, mud flies on top his hammer like they own it, his chest cresting and falling in shapes shifting between sunlight and leaves. Black steel, his destiny. John is motion at rest. Tides of moon and waves and still waters, suns igniting hearts of molten iron. A hardened conviction, rose petals in rain. Sleep is a dream, the real world a poundage. Work a sentence for being his mama's son. The hammer in his crib, the supernatural a drum song of woodpeckers, cowbells in the field. Heaven a home going back to a place before the bugle call to be born. Where the steel of plows. Where the steel of plows is made, a frozen custard stand sat on the way out of the city. Baltimore shrinking in the rear view mirror of our 54 Ford. My mother's arm in the window, the air in her hair, the Irish in her, a fire in her eyes. We made this trip on Sundays, my father wanting to drive to where. He worked on this his day off to see the victory again, a check each week, no hot fields down home in old clothes, his house now brick with a basement, a lawn, petunias in the backyard, his children in big city schools. One summer we all tore up the front yard to kill the crabgrass, back again in the feeling of farming, a grub hoe in my hands. I was like a man picking it up and wielding the thing, John's hammer against the mountain one more time, learning to be a human machine. In kindergarten, my mother turned to see me following her home, returning, going back to what I knew with all its joy, all its hurt, leaving universities. I put my feet on the lawn again to kill crabgrass, to study gratitude. So my parents uh, came up during the Great Migration uh, during World War II from uh, Virginia, uh, near North Carolina, Brunswick County, up to uh, first Norfolk for my father, then Baltimore for both of them. And um, they left, um, for my father's case, the world of sharecropping, which is his father had been born into, into being a factory worker. So I grew up with a deeper understanding of work that was rooted in industrial labor, but also in sharecropping and slavery. The Lay of Paradise, 1970. Three-story overhead electric cranes clicking, tractors large enough to carry elephants rolling, mashing the wooden brick floor down, down steel pins spinning so fast they have a silent hiss. Shears cutting shiny tin into thin plates at speeds fast enough to cut the bone away so cleanly a man has to remember to scream. The bailers pulling scrap tin, arms, legs, heads onto the pin, to make them small enough to be melted, sold as Cadillacs or prayed over in graves. The soles of safety shoes of men and women tapping metal plated walkways to workstations. I sit and sew word onto word. When the mill is down, I study the invocation and wait to see a poem come out from the skylight and the mesh of corrugated metal walls a web of language looking like nothing but carrying everything that makes everything, the crucible of metaphor. I am a child in the art. The art is a child in me.
So the hopeful firstborn, the son, left the university, dropped out, came home and said, I am a poet. And my parents thought I had completely lost my mind. And in some ways I had. I took uh, the job in the steel mill at first at Bethlehem Steel, joined the military, got married, joined the reservist unit, Army Reserves, and came back from basic training and got a job at Procter & Gamble where I stayed for 14 years until 1985. The title poem of the collection, Spirit Boxing. It is the tightness in the gut when the load is heavy enough to knock me over backward, turn me back on my heel until my ankle cracks and I holler out, Jesus, this Jesus of Joe Gans, setting up for the next punch while taking in one that just made his soul wobble. The grunt I make when the shift is young, my body a heavy meat on bones, conveyors not wired for compassion, trucks on deadlines, uncaring pressure of a nation waiting to be washed, made clean, me looking into the eye of something like death. And I look up, throwing 50 pound boxes, Jesus now John Henry, pounding visions of what work is, the wish for black life to crumble, snap under all it is given, these three souls of spirit, hands like hammers, I hammer like the word made holy, word echoing a scripture from inside the wise mind that knows men cannot be makers, that in making we want to break each other, make moving us to refuse to surrender to time in factories, catacombs, feeding on the spirit. At Procter & Gamble, we made my father's favorite soap, ivory soap. And I said, well, Pop, you know, it floats because we put air in it, which he refused to believe. Ivory soap, a whiteness. In the hot houses, the soap waits in innocence, purely white, soft, hard, cut up from the long tubes of ooze, from the vats where men sweat, knobs for the making of the clean, washing the souls like the Akan priests, sage work, atoms letting the eaves fall from them, eaves gathering dust to make the atoms, all histories writ and rewritten anew, again and again, until the company is awash in prophet hallelujahs. I open the door, let the steam of ivory soap whiteness fill me and take the trays to Artie, whose work is to feed the bars to the machine. It's stamps of logos, guarantees of purity embossed in the writing. The bosses of America's dirt watching to see that the machines do not rest from the perfect form of bars of soap sliding down the rubber belts under the spray of salty water, into the metal stamp plates, the wrappers with hot sealers for paper, Artie and Akito, master of the line, stopping to tell me the details of Russia from his last summer vacation, to ask my opinion on Islam, the Arab slave trade, the business of taking master's names. The thump and slide of the motor pulling the rubber belt the bars of ivory of broken whiteness marching out to stores to wash away the sluggish shame of being dirty. Cash registers counting the money we make from masters who sit in invisible places, designing our wages, what wages can buy, while men like my father, black and white, wash bodies aching with layers of sweat from mills and the holes of ships filthy with what it takes to make a life in a nation, obese with forgetting, hungry for what is new. In this virtual world, I can lose sense of the track of time. 
for my coworker, George, who grew up in the coal mining country of Pennsylvania, Beatitudes, the merciful. A white man born in coal country, George knew the power of dirt. What dirt can do, raise you up a mess of vegetables in a season of kindness between the hard edge of the hills, a gift for the hungry, a white man born where not much grows. He knew the dirt of work, of chasing Rommel across the Sahara, taking hot showers with gasoline. He knew to be grateful for having lived a soldier and come home mostly whole, meeting me for our afternoon coffee, our blue shirts, our blue pants, our blues and five notes. You need that five dollars, Mike? To give me what he needed more than me, I took the five and gave it back seven days from the first day of the week. Back again for coffee, back again for what is not free. Our blues, the five notes of this ritual. Here's your five back, George. Thanks. Need it again, Mike? Just say the word. A black man born in a steel city knows the power of dirt, how hard things come out of it, go back, back into earth, where dirt is the clean thing of a world, a mercy seat for men who love kindness, five dollars going back and forth until a day men are not only clean, but free. There was a phrase, or there is a phrase in that recent film that Michael Moore, um, uh, was, I think he was executive director for that. And the phrase is, can industrial culture save us from industrial culture? Which I think is an interesting question. And alongside that, some of the historical work that's coming out now that shows that the South might have lost the physical war, but they won the peace and how uh, the Confederacy's ideals became the foundation of American conservatism and the American West and Northwest by extension, et cetera, et cetera. And I think of that very often having grown up, been born and raised in Baltimore. And uh, so with men, some of whom were, uh, <laughs> they said they were in the Klan, it didn't make any difference whether they were or not actually. And that's a strange thing to say, but trust me, a legacy, Southern kin. Chickens being plucked won't cluck anymore. Boiled skin smell of hot pots in the yard as heads picked clean of ringworms won't itch after big sis has taken her fingers like an impish tinker, ignoring the way you cry while she plucks a hair along with a worm. Apples a teeny bit past ripe won't rot now that hungry hands found them hanging full on trees where the horses can't reach, their necks stretched out, bubbly lips pursed way out to pluck, but not enough to understand God knows what colic will do to a horse who cares nothing for what happens to his full horse belly lying on the ground, swelling beyond the limits of horse carcass to where equine cherubs arrive where Irish men make black babies with black women they hate and love at once. A thing is in the eye that cannot see who we are, even as we, either child or grown, stand under milk-white stars in some broad space at night, looking up to see what happens when we take two or three fingers in an arc like a falcon's head, moving in that rocking arc to bring down a star to where our world is being pulled on a string. The Gray Mare. With my left hand on her shoulder, my right hand sliding across her back, I take in the smell of horse, pushing my nose into her hair, rubbing against her until she leans into me as if she wants to fall asleep inside the love, stroking and stroking until her coat has the brightness of new starlight. The morning sounds of the brood of beagle puppies in the barn the calves out in the back pasture trying to nurse. Up and down the length of her side, one hand to steady myself, one hand to measure the distance inside a wish to be one 
with horse and landscape, the way the sky feels when I lift my hands, stretch my arms apart to split the clouds and know a horse is a fragile piece of God, the one divine bit of flesh that fell to earth with us, took on the definite bones of being mortal to be what we cannot be, strong where we are weak, weak where we are strong, so we become the one thing when I stretch my hands over the back of this gray mare and we are saved. Blood of a Union of States. Unloading six foot pieces of pipe off a truck to lay lines for natural gas, smoothing a tape measure against a piece of cloth to mark a pattern for a chef's apron, opening the door to check the gust of a windstorm, one hand holding you inside while you study the way corn stalks sway, the storm poking the field to move crops aside like a curious child spying on lovers, waxing the old Chrysler Imperial with pace wax, three cars done, five more to go until your arms fall to your sides, limp and done. Taking time between catches to test the water's warmth, an easy breaststroke along the side of the boat, the smell of fish a dream rising from a life of fishing, hanging a piece of drywall in a new house, pressing it flush so it feels natural, tying twine around a stretch-wrapped load of canned goods to load on a semi headed for Tennessee at night, stretching open the curtains to check the patient who has no family and find her eyes rolled back, her lips pursed on the last line of the 23rd Psalm, Setting another pair of khakis on the board to iron, holding the hem line with one hand, the steam iron hissing, unwinding a length of wire from a spool to string an electric fence. The sheep so dumb they can't wait to be shocked one more time. Time the billow roll across generations, making ends meet on the finishing table. The sheep herd is gone and still yet to be born, wool workers in the womb. All this motion of work with hands and arms moving the way a grandmama stretches the thread of crochet across her lap in the evening, thinking back over the way the years step inside us as we wind down to be pulled apart slowly into tiny bits of dust. When I, uh, this book is actually spirit boxing as a return to my very first book um i this was published in 1985 the year i left the factory and uh it was the product of 10 years of writing i did the first draft in 1975 a thin thing manuscript when i was working on the production floors of the uh, liquid detergent uh for dishes that department we called it liquids and uh, for 10 years, I picked at it and picked at it. And it actually was a finalist, the manuscript of it, for Walt Whitman in 1983. And Charles Rao published poems from the book and the book itself in 1985 in this uh, prestigious Callaloo series. Always grateful for that. That was my first book. And when looking back on these years when I decided that I should do this book, looking back on my understanding of myself and it wasn't easy it was not easy because you maintain your memories of home as home is changing so this poem where no good can live the air of the not mind of sleep collects little bodies of capable engines small as atoms with feet and hands, the organic crawling out from infinite birth of dreams, not nightmares, seductive tugs at fears that are not fears at all in the absence of meaning. No good comes where no good can live. And dreaming, I remember where I belong, not in the shimmering dust left when a golden eagle arcs across a mountain ledge, but where the mountain is made from inside itself by miniature workers who know what we deserve, 
we all so loud, but humbly grateful for what we get. It's the same door back, the same set of what life gathers in the shuffle of cards of circumstance, casting the lines from stars inside our minds, tying the tethers until the great weight of dreams of returning are held and given a bewildering breath and the atoms of engines completely similar, hammered from the first one so that nothing strays from the plan. I work until the crack comes between knowing and not knowing, between living and dying, the crevice dividing two worlds to where my breath fills me, I feel my breath to know again, and more firmly now, I cannot go back, as leaving, I broke the bonds of dreams. So um, I will close with the poem that is, that is the funnest piece to the collection. Um, and it's about a, uh, an, in, an interior um, piece of mixed media sculpture, gigantic um, birds, phoenixes, and it was done by the Chinese uh, sculptor Xu Bing, and it was um, installed in St. John's Cathedral. And uh, I want to read this poem for the times in which we live. Um, I re did receive in 2005 the Gold Friendship Medal from the Beijing Writers Association for my work in translation and trying to create community with those conferences at Simmons. And um, this past fall, Kristen and I uh, celebrated our first, our honeymoon, our first honeymoon, we'll have many, I love honeymoons, but we went to Taiwan and I was surprised, my godfather and um, my Mr. Um, Lu Di actually gave me the medal. It's the 96 uh, medal from the Taiwan's Writers and Artists Association, a national recognition for the uh, distinction and the attention I bring to Chinese culture, Taiwanese especially, in my writing. So given all of the commotion that's going on now in terms of China, China, Chinese culture and uh, anti-Asian racism. I, it's just heartbreaking. But I want to read this. Uh, Xu Bing's Flying Phoenix is an ad also that I read with poets from mainland whom I met during the course of my work and the conferences and my travels in China. Xu Bing's Flying Phoenixes in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I am 64. Millions of lives are buttons on the coats of magnificent birds that arise from lost memories of building China from under waves of assaults. In Beijing 10 years earlier, I wait with poets and students to walk and speak, wandering through this language of aging with Scherger, poet once homeless, now sung as mythic ancestor of generations in the word. These buttons on birds of metal rising from ashes are lives of men and women who went into jobs, who never came home, who came home and died for pipe dreams or dreams of a country, the dust bowl lifting up from starving families and the grapes of wrath. The shuffling armies of black sharecroppers leaving the South for the North's harsh ways under waves of assaults. In Kunming, I sit in a Muslim restaurant with a poet who gave me the Quran in Chinese, while around me folks celebrate the end of a day of work, and sitting in a park, listening to the Erhu, its eloquent moaning, where Yu Jin sings about working in a metal factory, while Wang Xiaoni worked on a farm later to be the first woman to write after re-education. What do we know when we die? when our poetry writes history. I am 19, three Negro classics for lunch, a worker poet in an America where our soldiers kill our students. We are pilgrims in our souls. Thank you. Yes, feel free to come off mute. We'll do a virtual round of applause. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really, really remarkable reading. Um, really lucky to be able to to get this spend spend this time together. Um, so we've got a couple folks have already put some questions into the chat. We'd like to invite anybody to do so. First one looks like it comes from Robert. I'm assuming it's Robert. Um, and this is a question about some of the elements in the poems. So Robert, would you like to uh, come off mute? Oh, you might not be Robert. That might just be your screen name. But uh, feel free to come off mute and uh, ask your question. That's actually me too. Um, hey, Apple. Hi. Um, what a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. Um, I, Folks, I, I'm sorry. I'm just just one moment. I am going to ask um, everybody who's not actively a question asking a question to go on mute, just because it we're getting some feedback there. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So Afa, I'm I'm curious just from a teaching perspective, if nothing else, if you might talk a little bit about how you navigate the narrative and lyric elements in your work and how you find the balance because it's so it feels very seamless when you're reading. Um and, and when I look at the work, and I'm just curious how you sort of make those calls as you're doing uh your uh writing and your revision. Um that is a good question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, that is a very good question. And, and um, I I don't have a formula for it. Once I'm inside the poem, I try to uh, let my, my sense, my inner sense guide me um, so that I, if I think that I'm telling too much of what happened as opposed to showing how I felt in that space, then I slow down. And um, and sometimes I de I de I'll depend on repetition and parallel structures if I feel there's a, a difficult uh, thing to, to get through. The, in the poem Spirit Box, and to me, there was so much going on in that poem um, around the idea of, uh, of Black men working and uh, building on John Henry and Joe Gans. Joe Gans was the boxer who in the boxing world, they call him the old master. He raised boxing to a science in the early 20th century and paid heavily for it. But, um, and sometimes I just trust the language. And if, I've, if I'm worried that the poem is, is too caught up in lyric expression, on an attempt at lyric expression, I'll just finish the draft and let it sit, you know? And, um, I'll ask myself questions like, am I being sentimental? Am I, you know, am I actually being too cold? Now, what is actually, what is, what have, what have I done? And of course, I can't answer all of those questions by myself, you know, it's, uh, and sometimes my wife will say, well, that's really good. And I say, well, you think so? <laughs> and so I'm not really sure, you know, um, but um, yeah. It's, it's, there's no formula for it, you know? And if I move to write something out of feeling, then I, I try to contextualize that in some event. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. Um, so folks, feel free to continue to, to pop your questions into the chat. I'm seeing um, a lot of really wonderful words and appreciation coming in here. Um, I don't think I have any questions queued up right now. So if anybody's brave and uh, just wants to go ahead and come off mute uh, and spontaneously ask a question, you're welcome to do so. I'm curious about how you first came to Travel to Taiwan and get involved there. Oh, uh, this is uh, Linda Kant. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Linda. Um, I received a Fulbright. I was studying uh, Tai Chi in Boston at YMAA, which is founded was founded by Dr. Dr. Young Young Jingming from Taiwan, and a classmate of mine encouraged me to apply for a Fulbright. And at that point, I had been doing Tai Chi since I was in my 20s and um, reading, you know, the Tao Te Ching in a naive kind of way. Um, but then I said, okay, so I applied for the Fulbright 
and got over there and just found my, my life being changed. And um, so I, when I came back, I started studying Mandarin. I, I lived alone in Somerville in, in my cave. And I thought, well, this will occupy my time. So I did two years of uh, Mandarin study uh, as a faculty audit at Simmons. And um, in, in my sabbatical year, I moved to Taiwan and lived there for about nine months and studied in a private school. And my, uh, my goal was to um, you know, try to build community between American poets and um, poets born in China, yeah. Taiwan, and Hong Kong, bring them here. And um, also as well, just my love of language, you know, and so, and so um, I went back and forth to Taiwan and last year, my wife and I went for, our, my wife, Kristen, went for uh, our honeymoon. My godfather said, this is your honeymoon. I said, okay, yes, sir, this is our honeymoon. So we had a beautiful time and um, I'm so glad we went because it might be a while before we can get back given the world health situation. So. But um, so, and I was really so overwhelmed when they gave me the medal. It was just a complete surprise. You know, I value some things, of, you know, that I've gotten, but that was just really special. Really, it's a beautiful thing. And I just have it, I sit on my rocking chair and look at it sometimes. <laughs> but um, that's, that's Taiwan, yeah. Well, that's not Taiwan, but that's how I got connected. Any other Thank questions? You. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that came in in the chat. Um, Sarah's got a question. Sarah, would you like to come off mute? All right, I'm gonna read your question out loud. Feel free to, to pop okay. in if you're here. Um, so Sarah Backer asks, what in, oh, are you there? I'm here. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe. All these voices come at me. It came unmuted, like I was in an elevator, and you know something <laughs> was supposed to happen. Um, first, I want to say um, my my students last semester really liked your poetry, and so they asked me, "Well, why did you invent the bop?" And of course, I didn't know. So I thought I would ask you, maybe you don't know why, but how did how did that come about? What what did you what may inspired you to say, hey, this is a form and I'm writing it and it works. And I wrote my first bop a month ago trying to figure out the form. Well, it it, um, it came about when I was uh, teaching at Cave Canon in uh, 1997. Uh, the co-founders, Toy Derricott, and Cornelius Eady invited me and, and Elizabeth Alexander. Elizabeth and I were first faculty in 1997. And I wanted to create something as, as a workshop exercise for them. So it began as a workshop exercise. And I've, I've used repetition and parallel structure in my work, you know, since I was young. But it was also influenced by my work. I was I wanted to be a photographer at one point, so I studied the golden mean. And so the principle of the one-thirds is, is in the bop, a one-third, two-thirds relationship. Um, but also I went to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in the spring of 1997 when I was a poet in residence at Bucknell University. And um that that visit impacted me so heavily because there were quite a few men, almost half of the men in the room. There were about 60 guys in there, and we were doing a poetry workshop. We're from East Baltimore, where I grew up. And, um, you know, the whole issue of mass incarceration is one, is one that's personal for me, people that I know. And that, that the signature, Bob, which is um, rambling, um, is, is came out of that visit to the penitentiary. So, and in its initial, in its conception, it came out of that experience of being in the prison and walking through in general population with the men, just seeing them hip, like they were hypnotized, just moving along in the stream. So that's where the bop came from. So a mixture of my interest in photography, math, and Lewisburg Penitentiary. And, you know, just all in there, so. 
You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Maria Luisa also put a question in the chat. Would you like to go ahead? Hello, yes, I'm, uh, Michael Weaver. Thank you so much for your amazing reading. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, okay. So my name is Maria Luisa Arroyo and I had a clarifying question. I noticed with your reading today, I, I'm so um, enthralled by your last lines. You know, so uh, every poem that has this, you know, Laurent Bossala is one of my mentors. She would say he landed it powerfully. You know, he, was, he had a strong landing. So how do you land your poems? You know, each of the poems, I could, you know, it's, they're powerful endings. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I, um, in the process of writing the poem, I try to, to be aware of, not only of, of the poem as it's unfolding, but also of how how I can bring what's happening in the poem to a, a satisfying close um, without being too uh, syllogistic. You know, I try to, and so at one point in my writing, I think it was after I had published my book, Timber and Prayer back in 1995. And I, I tried to, um, um, take some of the weight from the last line and just sort of sprinkle it through the poem so that the buildup became more uh, accumulative. Um, and not, and so for me, it's just, um, that's, and it comes from just sort of meditating on my work, you know, so reading the draft and uh, um, before the, the reading this afternoon, I sat upstairs in the TV room and, and read over some of my poems. And I asked myself, why did I do that? <laughs> but you know, I I, um, I think in terms of math very often, but I also think in terms of the sound of language, and a lot of that comes from my parents, especially my father. I mean, they didn't finish high school either one of them, but my father especially was very fluent in southern southern speech. When I say southern speech, it's southern Virginia, which is not the same as Alabama. You know, there are varieties of Southern speech, but, um, and he had these metaphors and proverbs that just rolled out of him. And it was that, and um, um, going to church, I grew up in the, in, the southern, in the Southern Baptist Church. I call myself a recovering Baptist, you know, but uh, there's that music, you know, and um, so, that sense of language for me is caught up in the music. And then, you know, when you're in church and you're singing those psalms and the refrains, that was embedded in me as a child. So I think that has something to do with it as well. I hope that helps. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Eleanor. Eleanor, would you like to come off mute and uh, ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll never forget the image uh, of your lines about the horse, too. That's going to stay with me a very long time. But my question is, I, I work with the narrative and the lyric blend also in my work and use the lyric when I feel like I have emotions that I want to instill in the poem, but I don't want to get too close. So I was curious about uh, what you said, that if you feel like there's too much lyric in your poem, you put it aside and you ask yourself if you're being too cold. And I wondered if you could say more about that. Do, do you feel that too much lyric can take you away from emotion? Um, my biggest challenge with that came with um, the, the Plum Flower Trilogy. I didn't read from that today, but um, those three books, The Plum Flower Dance, The Government of Nature, and City of Eternal Spring, are where I um, go into the subject matter of my child trauma. And the emotions and feelings there uh, were just sometimes just overwhelming. And I would have to step away or I would have to just write what came to me and then try to make some sense of it, you know. And um, I was in Taiwan and was studying Mandarin. And uh, when I started to work on um, the government of nature, 
And I wrote a poem about the tsunami that happened in Indonesia in December of 2004, uh, when about a quarter of a million people died. We just washed away. Um, but that was also for me about the forces of repression and memory in children who are hurt when they're very young. And so, and I didn't really understand that until I let the poem sit for a couple of years. And I went back, I said, oh, this is what this is about, you know, re remembering and the pressures against that and how you're washed away at, at times as a child. And so it's a combination of um, something coming to me and writing it. And um, I was in the monastery teaching Tai Chi to the nuns and for about five weeks or so in the spring of 2005 and taking a little break from the language school when I started to, to write uh, the government of nature and I started back at my poetry because I walked away from poetry for a while. Uh, so to answer your question, it's circumstantial, I think. Um, how the poem comes to me, um, what to do about it. And as I get older, um, I think um, my identification with the subject is changing. For example, John Henry, the poem that I read um, at first, is as much about me as it is about John Henry or all the millions of Black men who worked and died in slavery and after slavery. It's all of that. But it's only in getting older that I sense that that's happening without me really trying so much, you know. And uh, in writing about Baltimore, coming to understand um, that, in a sense, I am Baltimore and Baltimore is me as a poet. Um, but um, so uh, I don't know if I'm making any sense. It's not an easy thing to, to try to explain, but. Um, yeah, that fine line, you know, that very fine line. And there's a poem in the government of nature called Washing the Blue Chevrolet with my father, I forget the exact title. And, um, but I take the circumstance of talking to my father about the child trauma and being afraid to tell him because of his health condition. But I changed the setting of that conversation to a time when we washed a car together, which never really happened that way because that's the only way I could have handled the feelings that came from writing that poem. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two more questions. We've got one from Jennifer who's asked, um, asked us to read the question. Um, and Jennifer wants, would like to know, could you say something about teaching as a skill compared to writing? Both require communication and understanding of audience, but I'm wondering if you find that one influences the other. Uh, oh, it absolutely does. Um, when I came to Simmons back in, uh, actually I accepted a position in the spring of 98, but in September of 97, I, I started teaching there as a visiting professor. And I left Rutgers to come to Simmons. And some people would say, well, why would you leave a large state university to come to a very small school? And I had my reasons for it, you know. And at that time, by doing so, I essentially left the MFA world. And when I came back to it around 2013, I, it had changed so much, you know. Um, but my teaching at Simmons was geared very much to um, the school's uh, priorities for providing um, the best education centered around the needs and circumstances of women and um, a woman-centered education. And that formed my teaching concept. Uh, and, and, and so I can say in doing that, uh, now I, I retire from Simmons, but now I teach part-time at Sarah Lawrence in the MFA program there. And um, my style is my own, and I do have to say it just sort of really formed when I was at Simmons. And so teaching, uh, and I have to find, I have to restrain my tendency to teach because it can morph into my codependency. So it's not my business to shape minds when I'm not teaching, you know. So 
It is not my business to shape minds when I'm when minds when I'm teaching. I'm there to be present and to share and to listen. So, yes, it's uh, it it does affect your writing. And uh, when I'm doing just a little bit of teaching the way I'm doing now, it's enough to keep that spark going. So that's what I'll say about that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I want to wrap up just by reading a comment from from Alexander, who said, thank you. These these uh, poems are so powerful, beautiful and true. Um, thank you for weaving these words and wisdom for us. So thank you for that comment. Ah, there you are. <laughs> um, and Ava, thank you so much for this this wonderful, wonderful reading. Um, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, it's just about four o'clock, so we can go ahead and wrap up our time together today, but we hope to see folks for the final virtual summer poetry reading of 2020, um, certainly not the final poetry. Um, on August 9th, I think one of our poets for that is here, so wonderful to see you. Um, great, I would like to one more time invite folks to take yourselves off mute. We'll do a last round of virtual round of applause. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.